thank you for that special music. The burdens that we carry, which we don't have to, to bear anymore. That's what this song is about. And I think that's what this sermon is also about. And thank you for that children's story, which reminds us that out in the world there, life is tough. And that actually, if I may just interpret it, God has a desire for us to enjoy life in himself right at home. That's what God intends for us. Let us turn our Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And I'm going to begin reading from verse 16. Luke chapter 4. I'll begin reading from verse 16, and I will go down to verse 21. I'm sure it's a well-known passage, and it reads, I'm using the New King James Version, by the way, and it says, So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Let us pause for prayer. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for this passage in the Bible. And we want to thank you for the ministry of Jesus, one who came to heal us of our brokenness, one who came to bring that acceptable year and we want to pray that as we talk about this, you may talk to our hearts and that you may remind us that you desire to give us rest and that you have better plans for us and also that you have a kingdom that you have prepared for us where we can live in peace forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1995, my wife and I decided to go back to school. We had children, and we were going to sponsor ourselves. And so it became necessary for us to work. And it so happened that part of that time that we were studying, we found work at a factory. Both of us actually worked at that factory. I, worked, I used to work from about 3 o'clock to 11 o'clock, and uh, my wife would come in at 11 o'clock. Uh, she would hand me the baby. We had a baby uh, who was uh, a little more than a year old. She would hand me the baby as she was punching in and I was punching out. And uh, she would work the night shift. Um, let me not tell the rest of the story of um, our life there, but I want to talk about the factory. I used to, we used to work in the factory, and um, I used to be on one of those factory lines. For about six months, I worked there. And um, I don't know if you have ever worked in a factory, but we had to stand. We were standing, and um, my first appointment was to be a loader. We were basically loading some, uh, some bolts onto a machine, which had magnets, and we were supposed to do it fast. We were really supposed to do it fast because we were being watched. And um, 
uh, we had to be standing. And um, after you have been doing that for about an hour, you, you begin to feel your muscles aching. And you are standing in one place and you begin to feel also your legs are aching and uh, your back is not really doing anything, but it's also aching. And yet you must go on for at least two hours. And at the end of that two hours, we had a workmate who would be watching the clock. And as it was coming close to that moment, two hours, he would shout, break time. And we all loved to hear that sound. So we'd go for a 10 minute break and come back and do some more loading for two more hours. And then the sound would be heard again, break time. We always loved to hear that sound, even though you yourself are watching the clock. But break time was something that we longed for. I want to suggest, my friends, that um, we are living in a world in which we are constantly under stress, constantly under different kinds of pressures, a world in which we find ourselves aching all over, and we long for break time. I'm sure it's not only people who work in factories who long for break time. Even learners in school, we love the sound of that bell, which announces that it is time to go for a break. You know, God has created into the rhythm of time. He created break time. And the Sabbath is that break time. And so the passage that we were looking at today tells us about Jesus going to the synagogue in Nazareth. And the Bible is careful to tell us that as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath because the Sabbath day is a day to take a break. The Sabbath is not a burdensome day. It is a day that God has given to us to just put the burdens away. And without that being programmed into our time, some of us would work ourselves to ill health. We would work ourselves to early graves. But fortunately, God has given to us a break. And so on this particular Sabbath, the Bible tells us that Jesus went to the synagogue in Nazareth. Jesus was observing the Sabbath. The very same creator who in Genesis chapter 2 verses 1 and 2, after he finished his work in six days, he rested on the seventh day as an example to us and also so that he could spend time with humanity that he has created. We need to always remember that. When the Sabbath comes along, it is a day when we can take a break. It is break time. It is time that we can be able to put everything aside. And God reminds us, in fact, he put it into the very Ten Commandments, that's how important rest is to God. Taking a break was important. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, we are reminded that we need to keep the Sabbath holy and cease from our own work. But by the way, the same commandment, in fact, all 10 commandments are repeated in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, uh, they, are also, they are repeated. And when we read those commands, those commands, uh, you know, the command, the Sabbath command in the book of, of Deuteronomy, besides t reminding us about creation, the Sabbath also reminded the children of Israel that they had been in bondage. And so God told them, remember 
you were in bondage in Egypt. That's what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 5, uh, beginning from verse 15. God basically was saying, remember you labored hard and long. Remember that your children worked hard and long. Remember that uh, even your animals worked hard and long. And you know what it was like to be on those production lines in Egypt. And so I am giving to you the Sabbath so that you may rest. But not just you, but you and your family, your children, you and your servants, but even the animals, God wanted them to take uh, a break. And so God put that system uh, into, into place and the Sabbath becomes a day in which we can be able to recharge our uh, you know, low batteries, so, so, to, so to speak. It is a time when we can be able to recharge. But you know what? God was actually very serious about this thing about taking a break from the grind of work. We find that in Leviticus chapter 25, Leviticus chapter 25, God actually put into the system, into the rhythm of uh, the life of the children of Israel. God gave them not just the weekly Sabbaths. There were, of course, some other festivals that also, you know, when they were observing, they would not go to work. But in Leviticus chapter 25, we are told that God set apart or he set a system in place whereby people would work for six years and then the seventh year they would rest. Let me read it in Leviticus chapter 25. And I'll read from verse 1 right down to um, verse 7. It says, and the Lord spoke to Moses on, the, on Mount Sinai, saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep the Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyards and gather its fruits. But the seventh year... There shall be a, a, a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall neither sow nor, uh, your, your fields nor prune your vineyards. What grows of its own accord, uh, uh, what grows of its own accord of your harvest, you shall not reap, nor gather the grapes of your un, un, untended gray, uh, vines for it is a year of rest for the land. And the Sabbath produce of the land shall be food for you, for you, your male and female servants, your hired men, and the stranger who dwells with you, for your livestock and the beasts that are in your land, and all its produce shall be for food. So what God is saying is that after you work for seven years, when the seventh year comes, you don't go to work. I wonder what it would be like, you know, if we were to be told, 2022, you don't go to work. Um, I, I wish maybe my employers would hear that. Uh, I just want to throw that as a hint. Uh, I'm sure you also want your, your employers to hear that. Uh, if you run a business, maybe you don't want to hear what I'm talking about. You know? but, but, uh, but try to imagine that. Your, your work is in the fields, and uh, you work six years. And the seventh year, God says, don't sow anything. You are not going to reap anything. In fact, you are not going to prune anything. Don't even say, you know what, I'm not going to work hard. I'll just spend, you know, uh, 15 minutes just uh, pruning this tree here so that it produces. No, just leave it alone. Leave it alone. And when it produces stuff on its own, it produces, let's say it's an apple, you know, apple tree. Or maybe let's talk about grapes. It's grapes. It produces bunches of grapes. You may eat from them, but don't bring any into your house. You're not taking any to the market. Just leave it. The field is also resting, and of course, you are also resting. Your workers are also resting. 
And the Bible even says that, um, you know, you may eat it, strangers may eat it, somebody walks through your yard, can also pick some of those, uh, you know, grapes and, and eat them. And maybe you have some goats, and they go to the vine and they, they want to eat some of it. Don't send anyone to chase them away. God says, leave it like that. Let them enjoy. And God goes on to say, in case you are worried about um, what you will eat in that year, in verse 20, uh, Leviticus chapter 25, verse 20 to 22, God actually speaks to that. You must not worry about starving. You must not worry that you won't have enough food. So he says here, and if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year, since we shall not sow nor gather in, uh, in our produce, then I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year. So God is promising them, in the sixth year, I will command my blessings and it will bring forth enough food for three years. So if you are worried about uh, 2022, you're not going to work. Don't worry about it because at the end of 2021, you're going to get a bonus that is equal to three years. I think I like that. But that's what God did. He put into the rhythm of life that provision where the children of Israel were able to take a break from all their burdens. And the Bible actually goes on to talk about the fact that if they went through seven cycles of those years, there was going to be an even special, um, another special year, an additional year. The 50th year would come. I take it that uh, the 49th year is a Sabbath year because it is a multiple of seven, but the 50th year would also become another holiday. And this one would be special. In fact, you can read about it from Leviticus chapter 25, verse 8, and it is called the year of Jubilee. And in this year, not only do they rest from their work, but you would also have debts canceled. Debts were canceled. And if you had sold yourself into slavery, if you had sold yourself into slavery because of poverty, and the 50th year came along, then you would be set free. And if you had had to sell your land and now you had become landless, when the 50th year would come along, that land would be restored to you. God had set into the system a way in which um, he would provide for his people. It was almost as if, uh, if people had, you know, through their carelessness or pay, maybe through some bad events that happened in life, they had lost their livelihood, they had lost their freedom, they had lost land. Not only were they going to get recharged, but this was a way almost as if the system was going to be rebooted so that whatever bugs had come into the system, God would somehow take care of it. And these people would be able to have freedom. Try to imagine that you were a slave and you had sold your land. Hard times had come upon you and you had been sold as a slave and lost your land. And... Uh, as time is ticking and the years are going by, you realize now we are in year 47. We are going to year 48. And year 49, I don't have to work. By the way, every seventh year, their deaths were canceled. And now, you, 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 you are coming to the great big one, not only 49, but when year 50 comes, I can be able to go home. 
And I will be able to take possession of my land again and to start life all over. It was a rebooting of the system. In Luke chapter 4, uh, the passage that we read, Jesus told us that not only had he come to heal the brokenhearted, not only had he come to heal those who were blind, not only had he come to preach good tidings to the poor, but he had also come to announce the acceptable year of the Lord. It was the jubilee that Jesus was announcing. In essence, Jesus was saying, what people used to, what they were commanded to do and what they were supposed to do, all those benefits, they pointed forward to my ministry. They pointed forward to a greater relief. It was much more than just cancelling of debts. It was more than economical. Christ himself had come as the great jubilee. He had come to bring freedom and release and no wonder as he was speaking to the people in Matthew chapter 11, from, uh, you know, uh, you know, from uh, verse, verse 20, you know, he, he says to the people, verse 28, he says to them, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Because Christ himself was the true rest. In him, all our burdens can be placed at his feet. And so we don't have to carry many of life's burdens that we choose to carry. When we choose to run our lives without Jesus, we are carrying burdens that we don't need to be carrying with us. And so Jesus came as that great jubilee, the fulfillment of that great jubilee. And he came actually on a weekly Sabbath, he decided to come on a weekly Sabbath so that we will be reminded that every time we celebrate a Sabbath like today, we should be reminded of the great jubilee that God has in mind for us, coming unto him and finding rest in him. But we are also told that when Jesus came to planet Earth, you know, as he was announcing this year of jubilee, and uh, as uh, he was celebrating this Sabbath, he also talked about healing. We are told in the book Ministry of Healing that actually Jesus performed more healing miracles than he did preaching. That's a startling statement. We always associate Jesus with the spiritual side, and rightly so. But together with um, his interest in our spiritual well-being, he is also interested in our physical well-being. He is interested in our emotional well-being. He is interested in our relationships. He cares about us. And whatever burdens we are carrying, Christ wants us to be able to say, break time. It is time when we can be able to lay those burdens and come to him. And so we find that when Jesus came, indeed, the blind were healed. Ask Bartimaeus. He will tell you that it was more important for him to receive his sight than simply to have a debt cancelled someplace. It was much more important for him to receive that healing. Ask the leper that Jesus touched. He will tell you it was much more important for him to be cleansed from his leprosy than for him to simply spend a year without working much more important, a greater fulfillment of the year of Jubilee. Christ had come to bring that healing. And again, Ellen White in the book Desire of Ages tells us that there were some villages, some whole villages, where there was not one sick person because Jesus had passed by and he had taken away those burdens. And so Jesus had come to bring in that year of jubilee. In his ministry, Christ himself brought the rest and the release, the relief that uh, people would anticipate. Christ 
came to bring that even in his first coming. But I want to remind you that his first coming was just a foreshadow of the greater things which would happen when Jesus comes the second time. It is true that there are many people who were healed. It is true that there were many lepers who were cleansed. And there are many people who received some kind of blessing when Jesus came. But that fulfillment was only temporary. And it foreshadowed a much greater reality. Bartimaeus was healed of his blindness. But I'm sure at some point, sometime later, somebody had to close his eyes as he slept in death. Even Lazarus was resurrected from the grave. What a wonderful thing it was. What relief it brought to the sisters in Bethany. But at some point later, we don't know when, the Bible doesn't tell us, but this is obvious, it stands to reason that Lazarus again died and there was a second funeral for him. And so that great jubilee came, it brought us some blessings. But thank God, those limited blessings foreshadowed a greater reality, a greater break time, and that is the time that I am longing for. We all wait for that time when Christ will come again. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 21 and 22, we are told that planet Earth is groaning, all nature is groaning because of sin, and waiting and longing for the second coming of Jesus. And I do know that as we sit here, we all long for his coming. Look at planet Earth. And you see all the distress that is taking place. Look at the headlines. And in our days, what are the headlines like? There's not a newspaper that doesn't speak about COVID. Every day, on a daily basis. Not a newspaper that doesn't talk about lockdown. And you'll find from time to time, there's a lot of mention of uh, the economic meltdown and all the distresses that are taking place in the world, throughout, all creation groans. Look at the newspapers. What do you find in the newspapers? What are the headlines? Afghanistan. All we need to do is to mention the name, and we are reminded. What do we find in the newspapers? Wildfires in the United States, in Europe. What do we find in the headlines? KZN, even within our own locality here, disturbances that come and things that we cannot be able to explain. What do we find in the newspapers? Western Cape, taxi wars, murders taking place all over. But friends, we don't need the headlines. Even our own bodies tell us that creation is groaning. Our own emotions our fears and the stresses of this life remind us that this earth is not a perfect dwelling. And in fact, we all know that the situation is not really going to get better. Some things may get better. But while some things are getting better, there are others which will get worse. And planet Earth is quickly reminding us that this is not a habitable place. We need break time. 
We need to, be, to break free from planet Earth. And fortunately, God has plans for that. God has plans for that. And not only is he going to recharge the system, and he's not just going to reboot the system, but someday soon, God is going to reset planet Earth to factory settings, what he had in mind at Eden. And so, as we look at the world and we look at its situation, I, for one, I cry with the psalmist who in several places, actually many psalmists, David at one time, Asaph, even Moses in his psalms, in, in, in various psalms, they ask the question, how long, O oh Lord? And that, friends, is the question that all of us have. We don't even need to be reminded that we should ask that question. We ask it all the time. How long, how long are we going to continue in this kind of situation? But as we ask that question, we hear the voice of Jesus saying in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And he says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may also be. Break time is coming. I hear the Apostle Paul saying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, he reminds us, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. I'm thinking that shout will be break time. And with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will be with the Lord forever. Again we are reminded we will be in his presence. And I hear John the Revelator talking about our experience, what we look forward to. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 15 to 17, I've changed the wording a little bit because John is talking about them. He saw them and what is happening to them. And I'm saying I'm part of them. And so I want to speak about me and us. And so I've just changed that pronoun a little bit from them to us or to we. And so I read that text, Revelation chapter 7, verse 15 to 17. It says, therefore, we will be before the throne of God and serve him day and night in, the, in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. Notice again, he is dwelling with us, the great jubilee with us. And then it says here, we shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike us, nor any heat, for the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd us and lead us to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away our tears. I know a little bit about mopping. And when I read about God mopping our tears, I think of my own experience. If I get into my house and I find that maybe I forgot a tap running and there's water on the floor, before I mop the water on the floor, I turn off the water. And then I will go and mop. God 
will mop up our tears. But not before he removes the fountain of all our pain. Those things which bring a tear to our eyes. Jesus will turn off and he will remove and set planet Earth once again to factory settings as it was when he created. And therefore, my brothers and sisters, let us cheer up. Let us keep our eyes on the eastern sky. Let us not focus our attention so much on the headlines that we forget that very soon there is a trumpet sound that is coming. Indeed, I know we are living in these distressful times, but Jesus is coming and it's almost break time. May God bless you. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you are interested in our welfare. We want to thank you so much for making all these provisions for us. But most of all, we want to thank you because you are our coming Lord who is coming to deliver us from planet Earth. We pray, Lord, that you may keep our minds and our hearts focused on this blessed hope. And Lord, as we uh, face the challenges of this life, as we face distress, as we face the loss of our loved ones, and we fight illness, we want to pray that you may keep us fixed upon you. We don't want to carry any unnecessary burdens. But we also know that there are some burdens, such as physical illness, that we may not escape as long as we live on planet Earth. We may grieve the loss of our loved ones. We pray, Lord, that even as we endure those kinds of burdens, they may be lightened by the blessed hope that we look forward to. And we pray that on that day when you come to take us home, none of us may be missing in your kingdom. Mm -hmm. We want to pray that as we depart from your house, we may never depart from your presence. May we continue to have rest in you. And we want to pray that you may bless us, bless each one of us, grant us the strength that we need for the week that lies ahead. Continue to touch those who are unwell. And we pray that even during these Sabbath hours, you may bring to them your healing, we pray in Jesus' name.